Let's follow up the, the case exercise in flow analysis that we just did with a, a more structured discussion of how to do it. Uh, we're, we're now in, in session 16. I'm, we're gonna see some of the same things that we just did, but I'm gonna introduce another document uh, in this session that you need to understand. And there's also a supplemental reading here that I'll explain when we get to it. Um, we are still here in flow of materials. We haven't, we haven't moved very far, um, uh, but we've learned some things. Uh, flow, uh, a movement summary, quantified flow diagram, distance intensity plot, and we'll eventually join up with other relationships and move over here. But this is, this is one more session on flow, which is essential, actually, essential learning for warehouse and distribution center layout. Now, you remember this, this flow process chart for Homart. I'm gonna stick with Homart here as, as my, my teaching device, uh, and it'll help immerse us and, and do a better job when we actually do the layout work. I wanna introduce another document here that you haven't seen yet in this course, and that's called a from to chart. Uh, and what's going on here is we are documenting the movement on each of these uh, routes, let's call them routes, or flow paths in a, in a chart, but they're, they're routes in practice. And we've got numbers over here that represent the, the intensity um, on, on those routes. In this case, it's, it's total intensity, all classes. You already know that there's classes there, but right now we're looking at total. And uh, the, the thing I need to tell you about is that this chart, and we'll, we'll, we'll click in on it, this chart lists the areas down the, the, the axis, the left axis of the side, and then it lists them across the top. So it's directional, it's from the row to the column. And what that means is if you have two-way flow, which we, we do down here on one route, you have flow that's going over, and then you have flow that, that in effect is coming, is coming back. So um, we, we, we can't, we can't use that down here. We can't have the same activity pair appearing twice when we get our vowel letters. Now the, the, the movement summary didn't last session didn't have that problem, but this one does. So it says here, calibrate the two-way flows between activity pairs. So you always have to look and see if there's any backflow and then add that before you, before you plot the chart. And that, I, th I think that's explained in the sidebar there with the main points. But in SLP, this document is preferred to the movement summary. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna check this uh, here. We, the movement summary is easier for me to, to take you through that exercise because everything's on one table. Uh, in the front two chart, if you have multiple classes, you need one table per class. So here's the difference. This, this is a, 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 not, the, not the exact image that you just looked at, but it's the same data. It's on a pre-printed form number 247 on our website. This is the movement summary. This is a from to chart, form 136, that contains the same information, but it, it's built up from one movement summary for each class. Here I'm able to show each class in a column, right? All the classes on one sheet. Um, and, and, but I have, to, I have to be either from two or both directions on this chart. Um, if, if I have two-way flow, I need to show it that way. So this, let's, let's, let's be clear on the differences. The, the route product movement summary is a list of routes. This is a list of areas down and across. The route is only known by the cell that has a number in it. This is directional or two-way. This is only directional over here. Here it's one column per class of material. Here it's one table per class of material. Here the total intensities are in a column. Here, the total intensities are on a summary table. Here, I need equivalent units for diverse materials. Everything needs to be expressed in a, in a single unit of measure. 
which, which I have to figure out off page. Here I still need the equivalent units, but I, I'm gonna show you a, a trick or a technique that we can use to stay within the power of the spreadsheet or the workbook. And I can enter the, the raw data by class in actual units. That's, that's where I'm gonna take us next. But this, this is an important page for you to understand. There's two ways to, to record material flow. Um, I've, I've used this one for, for teaching the case up to this point. I'm, use, I'm saying that when you're in actual practice applying SLP, you'll typically use a from two chart. All right. Um, flow analysis by material class using from two charts. I want to click in on the right hand side here and get a little, little deeper understanding of what, what I'm saying there. So imagine a table just for the tubs, class A, tubs. Uh, what do you want me to do here? How do I populate this? Okay. I'm going to say, well, on which routes do the tubs move? Okay. Now you learned that in a column of numbers on the, on the movement summary. I gave it to you. But if you were working in actual practice and using what I'm showing you now on a project, you'd make your, your process chart and then you, you'd identify which classes are moving on which routes. And what you would expect then is to have a value over here. Every, every place that you see the letter A over here, I need to have a value over here. And, and what, are, what are you seeing here? This is from two to four, five, and six. This is from two to four, five, and six. And then I'm seeing over here, I'm seeing from four, five, and six, to nine, from, from, uh, from four, five, and six to nine. That's it. It's a pretty sparse matrix if you're just doing one class. Now I've got this one built in kilograms per hour. So I've already, I've already normalized everything to, to uh, intensity expressed in weight. I'm gonna show you another way to do this in a minute, but let's, let's just stay with this for a minute. Okay, so these are going to get posted. Then I would do I would do the bundles. Okay, I'd figure out okay where are all the bundles. Now I got the bundles. Then I'd figure out the the, the large cartons. Wherever I've got the large cartons, I've got them here. Uh, there's a value in doing th things this way in in a complex actual project because it's it's a this is a big deal. It's hard work. And, and you can overwhelm yourself if you have 9, 10, 11, 12 classes, which is not out of, out of the realm of possibility. You might have that many uh, uh, classes of material. Uh, and you've got, you've got uh, 20 areas. Oof, this is a big deal. So you, you, the, I think the, 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 the uh, idiom is to eat the elephant one bite at a time. If you put each class on its own sheet and do this one class at a time, it's actually manageable, right? If you're trying to think about everything all the time, it's hard to do this. This might take you all day with, with, a, with a group of knowledgeable people and some data. But it's worth it because at the end of this, uh, you, you understand not only where the intensities are, but what those intensities are. So one way to do this is, is using the common unit of measure that you've established ahead of time. Let me show you another way to do this. Summary flow in equivalent units. And now I'm, instead of using kilograms, let, let's say you didn't like that anyway. You thought that was a strange way to do it. Or you're living in a world where, um, the material handling effort is more a function of, of the cubic volume. And so this, this approach may appeal to you. In this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say the thing that we move the most often is a carton. That's the most common uh, class in terms of its, it, its movement frequency. And every time we move a carton, it's gonna count as one. When we move a bundle, we're gonna count the bundle as 
it's heavier, it's, it's a little bit more difficult, it's not as conveyable, uh, it's a problem for whatever reason, we're gonna say, okay, that's not as easy as a carton, we're gonna call that 1.5. A tub, we're gonna say, that only counts as a half, that's, that's an easy street um, a move. And we usually take two or more tubs when we do it. So, so I might cut this base unit in half with respect to the tubs. Um, the other items are awkward. There, there are things on hangers. Uh, there are rolls of stuff. Uh, the, you go back and look at the cartoon that I gave you to introduce the case, and you'll see awkwardness, strangeness, uh, which, which usually means it's, it's, it's a, a, more, a more challenging move. So we're going to call those things two. Fortunately, there's not much intensity there, but, but when we have to move those, it's, it's problematic. So, so this is judgment being applied. The best way to get these ratios is to talk to the people that are doing the moves. You get the, you get the, the material handlers in the room. You say, look, suppose, suppose you were getting paid by piece for moving these things. How much do you want? And, and we were going to give a buck for a, a dollar or one of whatever currency you think in, um, one RMB per carton. Uh, what, do you, what do you want for a tub? Well, I, I, I do a tub for half that. That's, that's okay. But this guy, you need to pay me two RMB. I'm not doing that for one. So those, those folks know what the effort is. And you're asking them to think about um, payload time or speed, effort, risk, you know? If you damage it, you own it, you pay us. Oh, oh okay. So now, now the one that's risky, I, I, I want more. I need like an insurance policy. So, so you'll work through this. Then what will you do? Then over here, you'll, you, well, first of all, you'll set up this table of equivalents on a worksheet. In fact, you can find this on our website, it's already set up. But you're gonna set this up on a worksheet. It's a reference table. Then you're gonna go and set up a worksheet for each class. And now what you're gonna do, which I think is gonna be a lot more comfortable for most of you, you're gonna get the actual moves, not the kilograms of something, not the equivalent, uh, cartons of something, just let me tell you how many cartons I moved, or how many tubs, or how many bundles, or how many moves I made of the other stuff. And I can, I, I can put this in in actual units. Now what's happening over here is every cell here is being multiplied. If this is A, class A tubs, it's going to be multiplied by 0.5 before it's summed over here. So this is a, a roll up or a summation of individual from two charts where the actual units are being factored by their equivalence uh, measure before being summed over here. So this gives me equivalent carton moves per shift. It's another way to do it. So if you look here, this is 34, um, which, which one is this? 34 large cartons moving from receiving to check-in uh, per, per shift in, instead of whatever we had. For, we had 42 kilograms of cartons per hour. Okay, this is actually 34 cartons. That's how many we actually moved. So for some of you, uh, well, all of you, I want to understand this method. For some of you, this would be a, a more intuitive, comfortable way to do it, and then factor that to relate the cartons or the tubs or the bundles to, to one base unit. The base unit would be typically your most, your most handled item. Okay, check mark on this page. This, this tells you the whole story on one sheet of paper on how to do a, a, a movement analysis using the from to chart and an equivalence factor for each class. Um, probably something nine times out of 10, on, on projects that we would be involved in, we'd be more likely to do it this way than, than to get the measure and then have a movement summary that expresses everything in, in, in that common unit. Remember the, the five physical characteristics, 
when, when you're trying to establish this equivalence factor, I'd always start with the physics. I'd start with size. I'd add or subtract uh, based on weight per unit of volume or density, weight per unit of, of volume. I'd, I'd add or subtract based on shape. Is it, is it stackable? Is it nestable? Is it conveyable? Is it stable or not? Is it, is it fragile? Does it have a strange condition? Okay. Um, here's a couple. Of, here's a couple of examples. I know it's a little hard to read, but you you can you can study the handout. Uh, you can't click in on a video, but but you can you can study study the handout after after I'm done talking about this. But I'm going to go back to something I've I've used before. I had an industrial service parts distribution center earlier that was um, uh, distributing parts for power plants. Uh, we talked about that briefly, and and you saw their activity list. Well, this was this was their these were their material classes. Uh, they had A through J, however many letters that is. It's like nine or ten. And everything is equal except for one thing here: oversized uh, uh, crates and pipe. And, and so you could say, well, why do you why do you bother to do that? Well, the reason they bothered to do that is is that um, the thing I mentioned about tackling this one class at a time makes it easier to do. So I have nine classes. The base classes is pallets and pallet boxes. Everything's equal to that. A move is a move is a move. But it's easier to study it one class at a time. The maximum class is two times the minimum, which is the oversize. We get double for that. Here's, a, here's another one over here. This is, this is uh, let's call this uh, maintenance and, and, and cleaning products. Eight material classes, about the same. This is fairly real world here. The base class is pallets, again, that's, that's what they move a lot of, but, but they, the maximum class is drums, and these are counting four times the base. The minimum class is an individual carton on a conveyor, which, which is, a, is a, a fractional unit, a tiny fractional unit down here. Okay, but they felt, okay, I'm, I'm going to call that three hundredths of a pallet. That's how they, they arrived at some equivalents. So the maximum class here is 133 times the minimum. I just wanted you to see, you can get spreads like that. What they're basically saying is, you know what, putting something on the conveyor, even if that gets to be pretty long, that's not a big deal to us. But moving these drums any distance, that matters a lot, a lot compared to everything else. So this is a place where you can equate and in some cases perhaps overweight a particular class because it matters more for one, for one of these reasons. And, and you want your layout to, uh, a good layout will, will reduce the travel of that class, okay? So base class, uh, and then, then there's your maximums. Some cases there's not a lot of spread, not, not any significant difference. In this case, it's really significant. Um, Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I clicked too fast. Uh, there, there's a, a supplemental reading here on something called mag count. Um, so, so this this is judgmental with the people that are doing the moves. If you said that doesn't look very scientific to me, uh, or I want something that has a little more rigor uh, than that, we do have something uh, that was developed many years ago called mag count. And I'll explain just a touch of it. I'll allude to it here, but I I, I don't want to take the time to, to do a deep dive into this because most of you don't need it. Uh, this this is something that you might find useful if you have extreme diversity of materials moving around through your facility and and you want a very um, systematic approach to measuring the flow. It's in a it's in a supplemental reading. Um, Imagine a distribution center that has maybe 100,000 SKUs, um, unique items, that range from a, 
a, a drill bit that you can hold in the palm of your hand to to uh, a, a a pallet uh, a pallet jack to some uh, a compressor uh, in a crate like this huge range in in cubes and awkwardness like like I got to pick a step ladder uh, versus versus a carton of of tissue paper okay. Uh, I got to pick a, an upright for pallet rack. We actually we actually store and pick pallet rack. Okay, so um, what was happening in this situation? The pickers. This wasn't done actually for layout. Uh, it, it 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 was used in the end for for flow analysis and layout. But what triggered the application here, not just in this example, but in some other ones that I could tell you about was the, the pickers are being compensated, they're, they're incentivized and compensated based on lines per person per hour. So you pick an item, you get credit. And I'm looking at you and you're picking this carton and I'm picking this pallet rack. Or you're picking this drill bit and I'm picking this 12 foot step ladder. But you're on easy street and I'm getting screwed. So, so why, why am I not getting more credit to compensate for the extra effort and time it's going to take me to pick this this ladder or this pallet jack or this uh, upright uh, pallet rack upright or go and find a, a truck and pick this compressor. So uh, what MagCount does is it looks at the at the differences in size and and cube and shape and so forth, risk and condition, and it puts it puts factors in to adjust up or down from some base uh, unit of cube. And there's a worksheet here in which that was done. Um, and, and what they ended up doing for layout purposes was to say, um, I, I'm going to get a representative sample of the items that are stored in each activity area. And my activity areas were bin shelving, full case, order picking truck where we went up in the racks and picked, a reach truck area, and a floor stack area and cantilever. So, so this was layout, remember, my, our four classic layouts. This is layout by storage and handling method. And from each of those, we'll, we'll take a, a sample of the items that are held in there, and we're gonna figure out this, this equivalence using mag count and multiply um, by the number of ladders plus the number of, you know, so we'll get the actual units, multiply each by its average uh, mag count, and we get a measure. That's all explained in a, in a supplemental reading, and I'll, I'll encourage you to go there if that's of interest to you. Now, let's, let's summarize with a, with a quick self-test. In systematic layout planning, flow of materials analysis quantifies the movement of materials between pairs. True or false? Yes, it does. Now, we, we talked about it as routes, but what is a route? A route is, is a flow line that connects two areas. So it is, it, it is in fact, uh, capturing flow between pairs. So that's a true statement. Movements are recorded in either of two tables, the movement summary or the from to chart. And it's very important that you understand that. We, we taught flow analysis using the, the movement summary because it's a very compact document, uh, but the, the from to chart is actually more common in SLP. The movement summary lists areas down the left and across the top. The movement summary lists areas down the left and across the top. True or false? False, that's backwards. The, it, it, that's not what that does. The, the from to chart is a list of routes. No, it's not. So, so, so these are both false because I've, I've inverted them. The from to chart lists areas down the left and across the top. The movement summary does this. It's a list of routes. So go back and study that if, you, if that wasn't immediately evident to you. That's explained on page three. But you need to understand that. Uh, the from to chart is the more customary industrial engineering tool. It's been around for a hundred years, and, and I, I'm sure the Egyptians did something like that in the sand. Um, 
you know, way back in the day. So, so that, that, that's a, a, a very longstanding thing. The movement summary is something Muther and Associates invented years ago. When, when flow consists of diverse materials, planners should allow for differences in transportability and material handling effort. True. You need to equate these things. A move is not a move if it's a really difficult move or very slow or demanding. The material class with the highest intensity should be given a move value of one and remaining classes equated to the base considering payload, time or speed, effort and risk. That's true. That, that's, that's what, if, if you're gonna use this technique rather than kilograms. You know, the one thing I didn't say that's occurring to me now, I probably should have said this. Um, you can't use raw cube. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back now, but let's just just think about this for a minute. Maybe there's another place later in a later session where I can go back to this. Uh, just because something is twice the cube, particularly if it's relatively small, it doesn't mean it's twice the effort to move it, or even twice twice as heavy. Something has to things have to differ significantly in cube or even in weight. Uh, you know, you have to get above a certain threshold before it matters. So um, even if you had cube in your in your database, you had measured all your items as stored or moved, you wouldn't just want to use raw cube as your equivalence factor because it won't always matter. It has to be a big difference in cube before one move is considered harder than the other. I, maybe we'll have a chance to come back and, and talk about that at another session. We'll stop there. Uh, when we come back next session, we need to catch up with the other relationships for closeness and, and figure out how to put those together with these things that we figured out from flow. We'll see you then.